Hi guys, on to chapter two. Naya put the container down and sat on the ground. She always tried not to step on the spiky plants that grew along the path, but their thorns littered the ground everywhere. She looked at the bottom of her foot. There was a big thorn that had broken off right in the middle of her heel. Naya pushed at the skin around the thorn, and then she picked up another thorn and used it to poke and prod at the first one. She pressed her lips together against the pain. Southern Sudan, 1985. Boom! Salva turned and looked. Behind him, a huge black cloud of smoke rose. Flames darted out of the base, and overhead, a jet plane veered away like a sleek, evil bird. In the smoke and dust, he couldn't see the school building anymore. He tripped and almost fell. No more looking back had slowed him down. Salva lowered his head and ran. He ran until he couldn't run any more. Then he walked. For hours until the sun was nearly gone from the sky, other people were walking too. There were so many of them that they couldn't all be from the school village. They must have come from the whole area. As Salva walked, the same thoughts kept going through his head in rhythm with the steps. Where are we going? Where is my family? When will I see them again? The people stopped walking when it grew too dark and to see the path. At first, everyone stood around uncertainty, uncertainly, speaking in tense whispers or silent with fear. Then some of the men gathered and talked for a few moments. One of them called out, Villages, group yourselves by village. You will find someone you know. Salva wandered around until he heard the words, Laun Eric, the village of Laun Eric, here. Relief flooded through him. That was his village. He hurried towards the sound of the voice. A dozen or so people stood in a loose group at the side of the road. Salva scanned their faces, and there was no one from his family. He recognized a few people, a woman with a baby, two men, a teenage girl, but no one knew it well. Still, it was comforting to see them. They spent the night right there by the road, and the men taking shifts to keep watch. The next morning, they began walking again. Salva stayed in the midst of the crowd with the other villagers from Lanark. In the early afternoon, he saw a group of soldiers up ahead. The word passed through the crowd, it's the rebels, the rebels who were fighting against the government. Self passed several rebel soldiers waiting by the side of the road. Each of them held a big gun. Their guns were not pointed at the crowd, but even so, the soldiers seemed fierce and watchful. Some of the rebels then joined the back of the line, and now the villagers were surrounded. What are they going to do to us? Where's my family? Late in the day, the villagers arrived at the rebel camp, and the soldiers ordered them to separate into two groups, men in one group, women, children, and the elderly in the other. Teenage boys, it seemed, were considered men for boys who looked to be only a few years older than Selva, who were joining the men's group. Selva hesitated for a moment. He was only eleven, but he was the son of an important man. He was Selva Miwin, out Eric, from the village named for his grandfather. His grandfather always told him to act like a man, to follow the example of his older brothers, and in turn set a good example for Kaul. Selva took a few steps towards the men. Hey! A soldier approached Selva and raised his gun. Selva froze. All he could see was the gun's huge barrel, black and gleaming as it moved toward his face. At the end of the barrel, it touched his chin. Selva felt his knees turn to water, and he closed his eyes again. If I die now, I will never see my family again. Somehow, this thought strengthened him enough to keep him from collapsing in terror. He took a deep breath and opened his eyes. The soldier was holding the gun with only one hand, and he was not aiming at him. He was using it to lift Selva's chin so he could get a better look at his face. Over there, said the soldier, and he moved the gun, pointed towards the group of women and children. You are not a man yet. Don't be in such a hurry, he laughed and clapped Selva on the soldier, on the shoulder. Selva scurried over to the women's side. The next morning, the rebels moved on from the camp, and the village men were forced to carry supplies, guns, mortar, shells, radio equipment. Salva watched as one man protested that he didn't want to go back with the rebels. As a soldier hit him in the face with the butt of the gun, the man fell to the ground, bleeding. After that, nobody objected. The men shouldered the heavy equipment and left the camp. Everyone else began walking again, and they went on in the opposite direction from the rebels, for wherever the rebels went, there was sure to be fighting. Salva stayed with the group from Lana Eric. It was smaller now, without the men, and except for the baby, Salva was the only child. That evening, they found a barn in which to spend the night. Salva tossed relentlessly because of the itchy hay. Where are we going? Where is my family? When will I see them again? It took him a long time to fall asleep. Even before he was fully awake, Salva could feel that something was wrong. He lay very still with his eyes closed, trying to sense what it else it might be. Finally, he sat up and opened his eyes. No one else was in the barn. Selva stood so quickly that for a moment he felt dizzy. He rushed to the door and looked out. Nobody. Nothing. They had left him, and he was all alone.